just really eager to throw me <laughs> under the bus as fast as possible for a little scheduling snafu yesterday, in which nobody was harmed. Nobody no, was harmed. No harm and done. The, yeah, but it, it it shows that you're you're not perfect in every regard. Don't don't try this at home because I'm a professional. <laughs> that part's true, Bill. Don't try hosting your own talk show at home. <laughs> but then there's an occasional mess up. But as you say, nobody was hurt Ask. except gave me an opportunity to kid you. When Matt used to work here full time. Ask him about Fridays. Ask him about Friday, Rob, <laughs> and, and mistakes. Yeah, Rob puts things into the computer and does certain things, and then I would come in on the, the, the next shift, yeah. you know, and, and be checking through things, and something would not quite be right, and I would, would reach out to Rob, and, you know, he'd be like, oh, yeah, it's Friday. Yeah. You know, it's just by the end of the week, he is worn out, but gets gets his rest over the weekend, and by Monday, Sharp as a tack. But, but this, this was, was Monday, Monday yesterday. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday around 9.25, I'm going, when's, when's Teresa coming in? She's, she's kind of pushing it. She's always here, you know, for plenty of time. I go to look at my phone, and it says, uh, Teresa, Tuesday on the 9th at 9.30. I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> but the uh, he he ran over like three or four people trying to run up to me yesterday at the hospice event to say, "Okay, look, you have to you have to say something to Rob tomorrow morning because he didn't think he was going to be here yeah, yeah. Uh, about having you thinking you were on the wrong day." Yeah, Bill Bill texted me. Bill Bill texted me and said, "You're going to get some grief tomorrow from Teresa." <laughs> yeah. You know, but he the, started it all. I know, really, but, he did. He started. But the it. other aspect, he's cantankerous. Yeah, the other part of it was it gave Gail Scrap and myself 30 minutes of dead air that I we know. could feel. Now, the radio audience probably said, oh, we're going to turn it off and go somewhere else. <laughs> no, they were, but but Gail Scrap and I were having a delight. <laughs> you, you guys were. I had the mute button on for half of that for you, so <laughs> nobody heard what you said anyway. <laughs> That's uh, why we got such good reviews. <laughs> uh, Teresa McCabe is here from WVU Medicine. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning. Always great to be here. You brought a friend. I did. I did. I brought Joni back. Mm -hmm. Joni Stenick. Um, she, it, 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 April is Donate Life Month, and, mm -hmm. and Joni is uh, in charge of our organ donor program at Berkeley Medical Center. Actually, she is the nurse, let's see if I get this right, she's the nursing manager for trauma and critical care at Berkeley Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Good title. So. Yeah. So when I got my driver's license many years ago, they said, Would you like to be an organ donor? And everyone thinks about that for a second, and you go, well, I don't know. Do I want to give that stuff up? And then I'm thinking, well, I'm dead. Do I really need it? <laughs> yeah, so I checked, yes. Yeah. So on my driver's license for the last however many years, it says organ donor. Is that what we're talking about, basically? Yep, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, there's many w different ways you can register, but um, we like to spend the month of April really raising awareness to um, organ, eye, and tissue donation and take the opportunities to help um, people become informed so mm -hmm. that they make the best decisions they can um, with that information. All right. So, uh, is there an, if you don't have a driver's license, is there another way to become an, uh, an organ tissue donor? Yep. You can go to donatelife.org. Um, you can go to donatelifewv.org. And then I just uh, learned that if you have an iPhone, that health app on your iPhone allows you to uh, register from that venue as well. So when you go in there to edit your medical information, um, you can register right there from, from that link. Um, there's one that pops up, register, donate life, and you can nice. register there. I, a lot of people think of donating after they've passed, but I would like to nominate Bill to donate Bill <laughs> while he's alive. <laughs> Well, what could we safely take, or not safely, I don't care, take from Bill? Let's don't put this up for vote. Bonnie gets to vote. Bonnie's the one that sent me the text suggesting that, Bill. What do you mean Bonnie gets to vote? So that actually is an option. Um, yeah, Bill, don't exclude it right away. We think of organ donation, um, but there's eye and tissue donation that happens after people pass. Mm -hmm. And that's still a, an option that a lot of people um, opt to do as well. Um, you know, with with eye and tissue, you know, that helps, you know, one eye and tissue donor can help about 75 different people. So if you Excuse sign me, up as a, as a donor, real quick, Bill, if you sign yes. up as a donor, does that include everything or do you select certain things that you want to donate and others you don't? 
No, that includes everything. But, um, you know, when we're looking at if we have a patient that is a, an actual organ donor, um, you know, a lot of people think they'll just, they'll take everything. Um, but when we have those cases, they only take the things that they can find a, a match recipient for. So if they don't have a match recipient, they're not going to take anything that they can't, you know, then in transplant. So. Go Bill. Yeah, two questions. One, what do we mean by tissue? I think I know, but what exactly do you mean by tissue in this so um, it, when they do tissue, uh, you think of tissue grafting. A lot of times they use that for like burn patients. Talking about skin in this mm -hmm. case, yeah, skin. skin. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they take bone. A lot of times they can take bone and, and transplant bone fragments. If um, you've ever had dental work, um, where you've had to have some, you know, permanent teeth put in, they, they'll a lot of times use bone fragments there for different reasons, um, and then. Um, for eye, you, you know, that's yeah. usually your corneas. Mm -hmm. And how much, I assume you said, uh, depending upon if there's a recipient, uh, how long can these tissues slash organs be held in storage? So the organs cannot be held in storage. There is a time frame um, when they do organ procurements. You know, there is a, a limited time. So. Um, they typically look at, you know, location of the recipients to determine um, where they can send them. Um, as far as tissue, they hold it in banks, and, and there is some time frames on, you know, the eye, or, yeah, the eyes, the corneas, um, and the bone fragments and those kinds of things. But um, as far as organs, you know, th there's about a, a three-hour window um, from the time that they take that organ out and then transplant it. So. Organs are very restrictive, but the eye and the tissue have a little bit longer. Three hours, I you occasionally sit beside a kidney organ on an airplane or something else. That would take more than three hours. Um, those are typically, when, when we have those cases, um, we, we do them at Berkeley pretty, pretty regularly. Um, that, that surgeon comes in who's gonna transplant that organ. Um, that surgeon comes in, he, um, you know, goes through the procurement process, inspects everything. They, you know, make sure everything looks good because the end result is someone's going to get that organ. And then as soon as they're done, they're immediately on a flight um, to that recipient. So is it as dramatic as it sometimes is shown, say, in movies and so forth, that someone comes flying through the front door of the, you know, the hospital running towards the emergency or operating room with the cooler in hand, here's... Here it is. I mean, it, it, it's an expedited process, mm. and, and, you know, there's a lot of logistics that go into it. Um, you know, and, and the more organs you're doing, the more surgeons that you are coordinating, but it mm. is quite a process, and, you know, we have to make sure things are streamlined because, you know, time is, is imperative in those situations. Whose job is it at the hospital once somebody passes to try to find out uh, if, if they're a donor, are they a match, where it's supposed to go, and how to coordinate it? So we have different organ procurement agencies all across the nation. Our particular organ procurement agency is LifeNet Health. Um, West Virginia is unique, and they have multiple, um, we call them OPOs in the state, um, but we work with LifeNet Health, and they are the ones who um, do all of the background in, in trying to find the recipients and the matches. Um, they're the ones that have the conversations. Um, we, as the healthcare workers taking care of the patient, are not involved in those conversations. That really is a decision that we have to be excluded from, um, just because you know we want to make sure our focus is to continue taking care of the patient um, and doing the best that we can to care for the patient. So we do not get involved in those conversations with you know the. You know, being organ donors and, and those kinds of things, that's a conversation that our partner um, LifeNet Health has with those individuals. And uh, you said a while ago up to 70 recipients. Mm -hmm. That would be obviously the organ, but tissues would play a large part of that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. tissues. Can. A lot of times they'll take um, tissue grafts from larger areas like the top of the thighs, mm -hmm. the arms, um, and those kinds of areas where they can get, you know, a large surface area of skin now we've heard recently there's been a, there's a continual breakthroughs but a pig valve was used uh, in mm -hmm. a heart are you seeing your category of of body parts does that include 
animals other than humans? Um, we don't do anything with those. Um, you know, there are tertiary centers mm -hmm. that utilize those for various reasons, and, and pig valve is probably a pretty common one. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do anything with that side of that. Matt has two pigs who are breathing a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have them. I was hopeful if I was in need, maybe, you know, we, we could use some of that. But uh, is there a difference? Um, in if if you have a patient that that is in the hospital that is about to pass as opposed to say an emergency situation there's been a major accident someone is in the emergency room for only moments before passing and and now both of those are donors but the two totally different situations how to how's it any easier or more difficult say with either one of those um well, I think um, it just depends on, you know, the, the emergency situation. Um, you know, they have to meet certain criteria before we even, you know, involve our LifeNet health partners. You know, if they're looking like they are, you know, moving towards, you know, they, their reflexes are gone and, you know, they're, they're not alert, they're not, you know, they're completely incoherent and they're looking towards, they're moving toward a brain death situation. Um, you know, we do have triggers that we involve them just so we can keep them on the case sooner rather than later. Um, but but there are various situations, and, um, you know, whether it's it's the one in the emergency situation or the other, you know, that's looking like they're going to pass, either one of those individuals really have the ability to help somebody else. Yeah, does that include age as well? Because I think someone in my age, or the heart can only have so many beats in time before it slows down. I would think the skin would be less determined by age, mm -hmm. but is age a consideration? They don't really factor in age um, because we've seen 70 year olds that are still really, really healthy and have very active lives that have unfortunate situations. So um, age is not a factor. They really look at the viability of the organs when we're looking specifically at organs. There's a lot of testing and, you know, blood work that they go and, and do just to make sure, you know, the organs are still viable. Bill asked that question because he's hoping to get out of my live donor situation that I'm putting him in. <laughs> Bill, no, you're still good. <laughs> yeah, there's a chair waiting out there in the lobby for you. <laughs> the one thing that I have going for me, you use the term live donor. <laughs> That's what I'm talking I about. Want, I don't want you to push me over the brink too soon, Rob. Uh, Joni, is there anything that you can't transplant uh, from somebody? Brains. Is that about it? Is that right? Yeah. Why can you not transplant part of a brain? Because a lot of people are idiots, Bill. And you're <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, didn't you see Young Frankenstein, Abby Normal? You didn't see that movie? The, the major solid organs that they do, heart, lungs, yeah. kidneys, yeah. Um, liver, pancreas, intestines, mm -hmm. um, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, that's, that's all. So if you die of heart disease, does that make your heart undonatable? For the most part, like there, you know, although, you know, with newer technology, there's, you know, sometimes when we're looking at some of these disease processes um, in, in individuals, it doesn't just automatically exclude them um, because there still may be the ability to transplant that organ and give somebody a better quality of life than what they have. So some of the disease processes don't exclude them. Um, heart disease is one of those tricky ones. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to transplant a heart, it, it's not, you know, the the most, you know, wonderful situation to get a, a, a heart that is diseased. Um, so they, they try to stay away from that. But there are other disease processes that happen that don't exclude them. From Can you re-transplant a transplanted heart so that a third person now benefits or a second? You know, I have my heart. I die. I donate it. It gets put in a person. They die. They, can they don don donate the same heart? I don't know the answer to hmm. that question. Let me, Has, have you ever been asked that question uh -uh, before? No. Well, good for you, Rob. Another uh, first, Rob. Another first, Rob. <laughs> okay. And you can live forever, right? Yeah, that's right. Your heart just <laughs> 10 people down the road. You're, you were hanging out with Benjamin Franklin. Next thing you know, you're with Elon Musk in the year 2500. <laughs> That works on the assumption you have a heart. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's true. Okay. Oh, a, a, related, a related question. Uh, a pancreatic cancer is something that is quite quite bad. Uh, if you early, if you diagnose your, uh, early in pancreatic cancer, can you 
get receive a clean or a uh, a cancer a pancreas without cancer? Um, typically, the the pancreas we usually see those um, not necessarily for pancreatic cancer because there's a lot of involvement typically yeah. with that, and um, that doesn't just stop at the not pancreas. Little, yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, they do say uh, if you find it, one of the problems with pancreatic cancer, you don't detect it until you're in stage four or mm -hmm. maybe stage five. But if you were able to detect it in stage one, could you, in fact, take the old pan pancreas out and put a new one in its place? I mean, I guess theoretically yeah. you could. Yeah. Yeah, it's just having one of those available. And finding uh, the disease early enough so that it's not spread to other parts of the body. Yeah, yeah. Tell Was us that a, a first also? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Rob. Oh, my have. gosh. Now you're trying to one-up each other. <laughs> this is getting out of control here. There's no limit to what Stubblefield will I do. I know. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to ask about, obviously, you're, you're on both ends of, of the spectrum when you're dealing with this. There's the sadness that someone is, is losing a life in order to give that organ but on the other side that organ is helping someone to to maintain a life um, how do you kind of deal with that and and you know talk to us if you have any stories of of just you know what that means to really both families in that yeah. situation you know a lot of times these come about in unfortunate situations and a lot of families find peace in that their loved one is able to do something good at the end of their life to help somebody else. Um, it is uh, a wave of emotions. Um, our partner, LifeNet Health, has a family support person that they always bring in, and they do a really good job at supporting the family and, and taking them through those emotions. Um, there's a lot of things that we do to support them. You know, we really, you know, all eyes on them and, and really try to support them and get them through that process and and you know um, meet them where they're at and and walk them through all of those emotions and allow them the uh, ability to express those as they happen because you know there's there's all of the emotions there's anger there's sadness there's you know just complete you know confusion about the whole situation and wanting answers and you know, and then finding peace. Um, we do a lot of different things with our donors. We do flag raising ceremonies so that we recognize the gift that they're giving. Um, and we do honor walks and different things like that so that the family has that time to really showcase what a, what a gift that their family member is giving. Joni, we're talking. I'm sorry, Matt. No, I ahead. just want to. Is there is there ever a connection, or or is that kind of frowned upon as far as you know? If 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 I'm I have a loved one who's receiving a, an organ from someone else, will I be able to know where that's coming from to kind of connect with that family? I think on the organ procurement side that there mm -hmm. is after a period of time the ability to mm -hmm. do that, but a lot of people do not mm -hmm. do that. Um, but it really takes both parties to be agreeable to do that. Yeah, Jody, we were talking in large, uh, largely about individuals in a uh, week in a sick state in the hospital. Mm -hmm. What about an, uh, an automobile accident or mm -hmm. some other accident? How quickly can you mobilize to get to that individual and start uh, evaluating if organ or tissue could be mm -hmm. utilized? So, you know, our initial focus on when those patients come to us is really take care of them and intervene and, and do the best we can to make sure that they have a quality of life. Um, we don't necessarily shift gears and focus on, you know, trying to keep the organs viable until the family has made that decision. Um, up to that point, our focus is really to take care of the patient and make the assumption that we're going to do everything to help them live. Um, and until that family makes that decision and agrees to do that, um, we maintain our focus on the patient. And we are just about out of time. Joni, how can people find out more about the April Donate Life program? Um, so we do have a flyer. We're doing um, a flag raising on April 15th. Um, we do have another, I think, radio show. Um, we have um, an information table in our lobby on April 15th. Um, donate Life. Uh, wv.org. Thank you very much, Joni. Good You're stuff. Teresa, thank you. Absolutely.